Rewind, your week in review is sponsored by the Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. Sharing one goal, enhancing the quality of life in Wisconsin through the development and maintenance of a strong transportation network. The Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. It's how we get there. Because I don't want to go backwards. I want to keep going forward together. That's exactly where we're going to go. God bless. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. This is Rewind, a combination of Wisconsin Eye and Wisconsin Politics. Look at this week in the Capitol and politics. First, Wisconsin Eye was there. Capitol News Conference on a call for Democrat Matt Flynn to end his run for governor. Worries about foreign competition from the chair of the Governor's Dairy Task Force 2.0 and one worker on the Foxconn project thanks President Trump. Wisai was there. I also want to thank the Governor for making a major state investment in CDR's future home. This uh, whole building area is about to become a construction site as we add space and renovate existing space and move the whole Dairy Research Center into the modern age. Um, and many other people in this room, we've got a number of leaders um, from the university and from industry, have worked tirelessly to make that project a reality. And um, when this building is finished, we will be able to even better meet the needs of the dairy industry here in the state. These are some of the worst cases of serial pedophile, pedophiles in the history of our state. Matt Flynn knew this. He's the one who was in charge of the emergency committee or part of that committee that put together the evaluation to find out the extent of the abuse and harm and damage this priest had done. They surveyed over 3,000 high school kids. Alcohol use down, heroin use down, prescription drug non-medical use down. It's all decreased. I think this is going to be a generation that we can help turn around some of the substance use and drug issues. I really do. Frankly, I'm a little bit more concerned than I've heard you know, people talking about here because the longer we're standing on the sidelines and looking like a bad guy, um, the European Union and other countries are busily negotiating trade packs with countries that um, we have been involved with uh, for trade. They've also been negotiating um, in many of these countries uh, geographic indicators for their products. That's a problem for us because when we've been used to making a Parmesan cheese and selling that to another country, um, this may mean that we can't do that and call it Parmesan cheese same product, can't use the name. One of the many people here with us today who will benefit from this plant is Celia Griffin. Celia, could you come up, tell us what this Foxconn job, this incredible, this really incredible plant has done for you and for your family? I started in 2005 as an operating engineer and Hoffman Construction gave me my first job in a haul truck. I went on from there to work for Gil Bain, building the Northwest Mutual Towers in Milwaukee. Now the two families are together, and they brought me to Foxconn to work in the haul truck again. And me and my family are grateful and very pleased to be at home again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Jar, this is the a picture is worth a thousand words department. Let's okay. put up a picture. Let, let's put up a picture of the groundbreaking, and the, let's let's talk about four of the five players there. President Walker, forty-nine to forty-nine percent approved, forty-seven percent disapproved. Governor Walker. Uh, Governor Walker. Excuse me. Thanks for the correction. <laughs> Governor Walker, forty-nine percent approved, forty-seven percent disapproved. Has a problem with the tariffs of the gentleman to his left. President Trump in the MU poll. 44% approval, 50% disapprove. Uh, Terry Goh, founder of Foxconn, said in his speech, I am paying back the Midwest because my first order came in 1974 from a Chicago firm, and it was a blessing that launched me onto this. And then you have Paul Ryan, who will be out of office in January. The speaker can't pass immigration. There are calls that he not end his career as speaker, but he's the 2012 vice presidential candidate. So that's my context of this picture worth a thousand words. What's yours? Uh, the, the guy next to the president 
needs this project to work to help him come November, which is why you're seeing things like today, they announced that they, a footprint being sent into Green Bay. A innovation center. 200 high tech jobs. 200 jobs. So um, Scott Walker has a problem with Foxconn. This was going to be a grand slam a year ago. We were talking about this. Republicans saying this is a grand slam. This is going to seal the deal. But ever since we heard about the 25 years that we break even on this deal, if things fall a certain way, it's been a uphill battle for Scott Walker. He's pushing the idea of this footprint will be outside of southeastern Wisconsin because the Marquette poll last week showed again, outstate their skepticism about this, yes. this deal and we're going to break even on it. That's where they went to Green Bay today. They want to extend, and oh, by the way, Green Bay, where Scott Walker was, I don't know how many days in a row for a while this summer. Because, because the Fox Valley is so critical to his reelection. Hugely critical to him. He needs to have a the change perception of Foxconn so that people see it the way he does and not the way the perception is right now of it's going to be great for Racine County, maybe for like southeastern Wisconsin, but Eau Claire, La Crosse, Rhinelander, not so much. Right, right. Okay, now let's take a, a couple minutes, I think it's three minutes, and listen to some of the speeches at, okay, they, they break ground, then they go and they, they, they do the speeches. So let's listen to speeches from the governor, the president, Mr. Go, and, Mr. and Speaker Ryan. Let's go to that one. Let's go get it, right? Let's go get it. Come on. This is a good deal for the taxpayers. An independent review or an independent report commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce in Milwaukee shows that Foxconn will add $51 billion to the state's economy over the next 15 years. That's a return of $18. $18 for every $1 in tax incentives, 18 to 1 sounds like a pretty good return on the taxpayers' dollars. Foxconn will help Wisconsin win the 21st century. This project is going to bring a whole new sector to our state's economy, to Wisconsin Valley. And what we are doing, this generation of leaders, from the president to Terry Go to Scott Walker, to our educators, to our manufacturers, to the men outside in hard hats who are making the dirt move to put this project on the ground, what this shows is we are fulfilling our generation's commitment, duty, and legacy that we do in this country. What is that commitment? What is that legacy? You leave the next generation better off. This is $10 billion investment will create 13,000 jobs in Wisconsin. And not just any jobs, but high-tech jobs, high-paying jobs high potential jobs, high value jobs. To Silicon Valley and Boston, Wisconsin Valley is coming. Moments ago, we broke ground on a plant that will provide jobs for much more than 13,000 Wisconsin workers. And there are very few governors that I could have said, good luck, you're going to build one of the largest operations in the world, over 20 million feet. Good luck. I gave it to Scott Walker. He literally didn't have to make a phone call to me for the last year and a half. He is an unbelievably talented guy. I'm telling you, Scott Walker. So even at this early stage, the economic benefits of this new plant are being felt in 60 of Wisconsin's 72 counties already. Don't worry, in another three weeks, It'll be 72. Foxconn has already contracted 27 local Wisconsin companies to begin construction of the main facility. As big as this is, this is just a toy compared to the main facility. And I'm pleased to report that Foxconn intends to build 100% of the factory with beautiful American concrete and beautiful American steel made right here. To Foxconn and to Terry Go, and to all of the amazing Wisconsin workers with us today and all over the state, I want to wish you good luck and congratulations on truly one of the Eighth wonder. I, I think we can say this is, we can say, the eighth wonder of the world. This is the eighth wonder of the world. Eighth wonder of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I looked up the eight 
ancient wonders. So the Foxconn campus is going to be comparable to the Great Pyramid of Giza, Temple of Artemis, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, Statue of Zeus, Colossus of Rhodes, and Stone, Stonehenge in England. I've not been to any of those, have, have you? I've been to Stonehenge. Okay. Um, one little thing bit of overspeak, eighth wonder of the world? The president has been known to use flowery language. How about that? Okay, thank you very much. One thing that's in context of why Walker and friends are struggling a little bit with this project and perception is the stories that kind of came ahead of this groundbreaking about how already Foxconn's talking about doing a smaller screen, I believe, yeah. initially. Now, we will see what this project turns into. We will not know. Quite honestly, we won't know for maybe 20, 25 years if this thing pays off, if we get the maximum what it could have been. But when you have stories like that coming out as you're trying to tout the groundbreaking, it kind of makes it difficult. And oh, by the way, the president walked all over the message by her, with this talk of Terrace and Harley Davidson for three days we'll and the, the day next. of. Yeah, we will. But what about the line that the president said, um, I hope he, a reference to Governor, Governor Walker there, not, not, uh, Governor Walker doesn't run against me. Seems to me the governor ran against Mr. Trump, one of 12 in 2015. Well, it's so interesting about this is, and talking to people this week about the governor not taking on Trump about the, the tariffs with Harley Davidson. Yeah. And cheesemakers, by the way, too, not very happy right now what's going on. That there's no upside if you're a Republican to take on Donald Trump. Um, people have tried and not done so well afterward if you're in the Republican Party. The base is unified behind him. Scott Walker needs that base to be unified behind him come November. He needs these Trump supporters in northern and western Wisconsin who may be new voters. We don't know yet if they will turn out when Trump's not on the ballot. He needs them. The flip side is if you're not accepted to Trump, are you losing those suburban women who the party has been hemorrhaging because of Trump? I mean, there's a, this fine line to weave or to walk. Another thing for I, somebody told me about Kansas week is that if you're a Republican candidate right now, throw out the rules about past midterms. You may have to find your own path in this environment where you don't alienate Trump voters, but you separate yourself from Washington, D.C. in some ways, or Trump in some ways, to show that you're not just you know, a carbon copy of the president because he is unique in what he can do. Yeah. I've never seen a candidate like Trump who can do what Trump does and succeed. I Nobody else can replicate that success. Nobody else can. Okay, new subject. Let's talk about <laughs> Harley Davidson. The, in the wake of European tariffs on motorcycles, our Wisconsin-made motorcycles, Harley said those tariffs could add 22 to 2,400 per bike. Ergo, we're going to begin manufacturing in Europe, to which the president said, if that Wisconsin icon moves manufacturing to Europe, quote, it will be the beginning of the end, the oil will be gone, and they will be taxed like never before. But you have this irony, because you and I have seen the governor on his 2003, Harley, so. and he uses it to campaign, and he uses it to promote tourism. So the governor's spokesman said, Governor Walker believes there should be no tariffs or trade barriers. This is the same governor who just shoveled that ceremonial dirt next to Mr. President Trump. And again, Trump. want to answer questions about Trump's immigration policies, the border, what was going on there. Again, I just said, there's no real upside. So how do you walk that line? For President Trump, um, it's interesting talking to people. There is a, a, a personal nature to these outrages that he has about certain things. He hosted Harley at the White House, remember? They had the bikes out on the White House lawn. Oh, yeah. This is personal to him that he hosted this company there. They're, in her, his words, waving the white flag, and now he's threatening them because he feels a personal affront, it seems like, about what they're doing. But in talking to people here, this is a company that has shareholders and has a fiduciary responsibility to them to... The greatest on, return. ...maximize profits. Yes. They're looking at a calculation going, okay, there are going to be tariffs on these bikes from the European Union. It makes sense to move that production for Europe elsewhere because they already have plants in Brazil and India. They've got one announced last year in Thailand that it makes sense to move this stuff overseas to avoid that tariff, that extra cost, yes. which could make that bike cost prohibitive to customers in Europe. Uh, they're in a very difficult situation. Well, and I was also struck, you and I, as we watched the president's speech yesterday, wondered what he would say about Harley, and he did again scold them. So let's listen to a segment that has the president scolding Harley, then talking about his position on tariffs in general, and then the governor saying, you know, tariffs really aren't good for our dairy industry and obliquely a reference to Harley. Let's listen to that right now, please. And Celia, we want to tell, by the way, Harley Davidson, please build those beautiful motorcycles in the USA, please, okay? Don't get cute with us. Don't get cute. 
They don't realize the taxes are coming way down. They don't realize that yet. Spend a lot of time with them. Build them in the USA. Your customers won't be happy if you don't, I'll tell you that. We are demanding from foreign countries, friend and foe, fair and reciprocal trade. We have been very much taken advantage of as a country. We've lost our companies. We've lost our jobs. They build a product, they send it in. And I just want to let you know, we put tariffs on steel and aluminum. Those businesses are through the roof. But the ultimate goal, if we can get there, would be uh, no tariffs, or if, if anything, few tariffs on anything. Um, because uh, it's not just the tariffs that presence and administrations brought up, it's tariffs for years that many of our trading partners have had, or, or things that act like tariffs. If you look in Ontario, for example, the price controls on the dairy industry in Canada has a negative impact on uh, d dairy farmers and the industry here in Wisconsin. So that's one of our best trading partners. We love doing business with Canada. We want to keep doing business with Canada, uh, whether it be in agriculture, manufacturing, or otherwise. Uh, but it would be a lot easier if we could do it on a level playing field. So that's what I'm going to push for is ways that we can get to a level playing field. Uh, then we don't have this tit for tat uh, on any number of products out there. JR, any PS on the president putting well, his <laughs> fingers in the eyes of Harley? About the ups, the no upside? Yeah. Harley has not said anything about Donald Trump and his all week long. They were quiet. The only statement they put out was to push back on a, what they said was a fake quote circulating on social media that the CEO called Trump a moron. Um, that's an illustration of like the risk you take when you cross the president because we both know from being on social media that there is a lot of truly fake stuff, not quote unquote fake news, but truly made up stuff on social media. Yeah. There's an example of what can happen when you're on the wrong side of him and somebody back him go, well, I got it. It's real easy to make this thing up and make them look bad. Yeah, good point. Okay, new subject. The U.S. Supreme Court world ruled in the case uh, South Dakota versus Wayfair that states can tax internet sales, sales even if the company does not have a so-called presence. Mm -hmm. Now, the only estimate we have is from the Government Accountability Office that this could be, and this is very speculative, could be worth between 123 million to 187 million. In which case, uh, Representative John Mako, Chair of Assembly Ways and Means, says we could reduce income or property taxes. Uh, Dale Coinga, uh, member of Joint Finance and a CPA, it's an opportunity for tax reform. Um, the governor's office is staying silent on this in DOR generally, JR? Basically what Walker has said was on Monday was that this money should go toward reducing taxes elsewhere. Yeah. There are questions though because in 2013 on that budget, public excluded provision, if you could start collecting this sales tax, it should drive down income taxes. But from what revenue told us, they're trying to figure out how this is all going to work. They need some time to study it. So there's not a clear trigger to me. Not, I'm not a lawyer that knows the language inside out of that budget provision from five years ago, but they've got to figure out how this would work. And oh, by the way, Republicans are assuming that this will be in charge January 6th, whatever it is, next year after Inauguration Day. Right. If there's a new governor or a new control of a chamber. If, what, if one of the houses flips to yeah, Dems. The Dems may have a different idea what to do with this money. But for right now, the talk from Republicans is about taking this and offsetting taxes elsewhere, because in Walker's uh, kind of thought process, you should not have a tax bump you should have this lower tax elsewhere to keep it tax neutral. Well, and also, let's put the 123 to 187 in perspective. The uh, child tax rebate is estimated to cost 122 million. Yep. So if this comes in every year, it could pay for that. Um, let's look at uh, the response of Tony Evers, who is number one in the polls uh, in terms of the early polling. Yeah. Uh, if you disregard the uh, don't know undecided, <laughs> who said, one look at our schools, roads, and cost of health care, and it's easy to see where we need to make strong investments with any additional revenue. That's easy for Mr. Evers to say he's nothing specific on that. No. Absolutely that's, not. That's the benefit of being not in power. You yep. don't have to be specific. Right. Don't have to have a plan. Okay. Happened early uh, last year. Uh, Speaker Ryan and our, the dean of the congressional delegation, delegation, Jim Sensenbrenner, from the 5th District, endorsed Leah Vukmir issuing this statement, Leah is a longtime friend of ours, and she has been a conservative partner among grassroots Republicans for years. She's proven that in the face of opposition, she will never waver and, and will work relentlessly for the causes that she believes in. Explain to me the nexus this coming out days after the latest MU poll. Well, and also don't forget, uh, Sean Duffy endorsed her yesterday. Yesterday, 7th District. 
three of the five members of congressional delegation. I don't think Gallagher or Grofman have said anything yet. Right. Um, this is part of the establishment, Republican establishment, kind of embracing Leah Vukmir. Remember, she's endorsed by the Republican Party. Yep. Uh, to be honest with you, endorsements to me don't mean a whole lot because unless they come with money, organization, what do they really mean? I mean, it's a great story for I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. But is Paul Ryan going to turn out voters in November or August for Leah Vukmir in that primary? Not sure about that. He has campaign did tell me it plans to transfer over ten thousand dollars to Leah, five thousand bucks for primary, yeah. five thousand general, which hey, that's that uh, helps. But the bigger deal for her is a GOP endorsement because they'll actually do voter turnout. Um, I'm not sure the significance of this, other than one point made to me this week was that having Ryan's kind of seal of approval, national donors may see this as okay. If Paul Ryan's behind her, then that's maybe a good avenue to invest in her candidacy. She does need help financially to catch up with Kevin Nicholson. She's traveling consistently. The polls have been kind of all over the place. And, you know, Marquette, when you look at the Marquette primary polls from last week and talking to people, you know, what Charles Flickin does is he gives a sample of 800 people, 800 registered voters, and says, okay, you're likely to vote in the Democratic primary, Republican primary, what would you do? The margin of error is quite high, six or seven points, I, I believe. I think it's six. And if you, were pure, if you were polling purely primary voters, you do a different approach. Yes. So there are some kind of caveats to his, poll, to his survey. That said, um, it's been a little back and forth between her and Nicholson. She w could use some, a financial boost to help kind of build, build her name recognition a little bit because he's had millions spent on his behalf by outside groups. A $200,000 digital ad announced just this week from one of those groups. So he's had the financial advantage so far. She could use some help even that. Okay, and I want to come back to a point you made. Then potentially the biggest help for Leah Vukmir by the endorsement of Speaker Ryan is his ability to raise money because go back to what he raised last year, $53 million More for the House Republicans. The seal of approval that people may see, okay, Ryan's behind her, maybe I should give or look at giving that race to her. So okay. that may help. But again, endorsements, union ones help with turnout with Democrats. You know, Emily's lift with Kelda Roy's, that helps a great deal because they may do TV. If you're doing things like that, if you're doing TV, if you're doing radio, if you're actually pumping money in, that's a bigger deal than if you or I endorse somebody, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the public service segment of the show. Let's announce that, uh, let's remind parents that they have until next Tuesday, July 2nd, to claim the, um, do we have that right? Is Monday. July? Monday. Thank you. Two corrections. I appreciate that, JR. To, to claim the 100 per child rebate. And you can go to the DR, DOR website. As of today, 506,224 claims have been filed. And Secretary, uh, Revenue Secretary uh, Chandler says, it's easy to put this off and think you'll do it later. However, after July 2, we are unable to accept claims. So if you're eligible, don't wait. JR, don't wait. Here's the thing. Uh, there was a concern from Republicans originally with this that it was kind of gimmicky and that the cost of it would end up benefiting 671,000 households out of 3 point some million in Wisconsin. For every household below 671 that Republicans don't get, or don't register for this, it's one less household that sees the benefit of this money, right? That's part of why, I mean, obviously Scott Walker wants to see people get money back from the government, yep. but politically, they're putting the big push on because everybody who's sort of that 671 is a missed opportunity for them with the tax benefit that they approved, in part to send a message to voters of, hey, these GOP policies are producing this benefit for you, you should come remember that come November. And um, these, you can get a, a check or it, you can have direct a direct deposit. deposited. And I, I'm such a skeptic. I asked somebody at the, uh, the Walker administration, is the governor's name on this check? The answer, no. <laughs> DOA Secretary Ellen Nowak. So, okay, let's go to your stock report. So Evers, Rising. Tony Evers, um, this is kind of inside baseball, but he got a, a legal win this week. And that's the second big one from the Supreme Court in like three or four years. Go ahead. So the Supreme Court said that Tony Evers has the, the right to pick the attorney of his choice in this lawsuit over Ministry of Rules. When lawmakers pass a law, agencies have to find ways to implement them through the administrative rules process. A prior Supreme Court ruling said that DPI is not subject to this older law because it's a separate constitutional office. There's a new law approved last year by Republicans that sought to impose some of something similar on DPI. Evers has refused to abide by it, saying that look, this past decision. There's a lawsuit filed in the process of this uh, Governor Walker and DOJ said, we're going to have DOJ represent you, Tony Evers. You can't pick your attorney. Right. No, by the way, DOJ backs the position of the conservative group suing, saying that you should be subject to this. The court said no. 
We're going to give Tony Evers the opportunity to pick his own representation. There are concerns that they have with that approach, and what they called the, quote, breathtaking power it would give the Attorney General if they sided with him. It was a 4-3 decision. Yep. Three conservatives say, uh, Gableman Kelly and was it Rebecca Grassley? Rebecca Bra Bra Bradley. Dissented, Bradley, excuse me. Dissented, saying this is not right, that's, you know, the power is not so there. So then you had Ann Walsh Bradley and uh, Shirley Abramson and the Chief Justice, yeah. So now the next thing is, so this is a legal win, okay, it's nice. But the bigger picture is he also has to win on the merits of the case. It said nothing to the merits of the case whatsoever. Right. So what happens next with that? Those three conservatives who weren't happy about giving him his own power to pick an attorney, if they vote no, he's subjected to it, he's got to pick up one more and reverse that. So that's something to watch there. So it's kind of inside baseball win, but still a political, uh, a legal win for him. Yeah, and uh, you and I saw the fundraising, so immediate fundraising solicitations from mm -hmm. the Evers campaign. Hey, we're on a roll here. Okay, now you're picking the president as mixed. Does that have anything to do with the fact that he got the date <laughs> wrong of the, go ahead. So these presidential visits to like states, swing states, should be media gold. Because much like when we in Madison go, oh, the governor's going to pick your small media market outstate Wisconsin is gonna get friendly questions from them because they don't cover stuff every day. The national media is going, oh, the president's going to some place where he's gonna get the unfiltered you know, message out because the local media will cover pretty much you know, the, the, the stop wall to wall. President Trump has found a way to walk all over that message with the Harley-Davidson fight. What was the headline on the Journal Sentinel this morning with the picture of them did the groundbreaking? Yeah. Trump defends tariffs. He took time during this like celebration about Foxconn to take another dig at Harley-Davidson. He picked a fight with a Wisconsin icon for three straight days ahead of coming. It doesn't make sense to people, especially in a state where he's upside down with approval rating, has been since before he got elected, he won with a plurality of the vote, not a majority, plurality, about 23,000 votes, a little less than that. So it's like, what are you doing? But the flip side is, there have been stories this week talking to Harley employees going, you, like, guys on the floor are going, yeah, you know, he's standing up for us. President Trump seems to have tapped into something with the, the rank of these, the assembly line guys, these people on the front lines that they believe he's fighting for them, even when he's doing things that could put their jobs in jeopardy. It's amazing to watch in some ways. It is. And the president said incorrectly that... He's the first Republican to win Wisconsin since Eisenhower. I guess he forgot Ronald Reagan. Uh, one first Wisconsin one comes to mind. In president 1984. Nixon, that okay. the one comes to mind. Okay. <laughs> yep, falling. So Matt Flynn. So after last week with um, Dana Walks and Andy Gronick dropping out of the race, the reaction I got from people was, this really is down to three people for the Democratic nomination. Tony Evers, Kel DeRoy's, Milan Mitchell. Um, Matt Flynn's not one of them in part because there is this humongous issue that he has with representing the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, the priest abuse scandal. As now, we alluded to in which I was there. People I talk to think this is a fatal flaw for his candidacy. Flynn has a blind spot to that issue. He thinks he can get through it. What's interesting to me is that in talking to people, he is the wild card right now in this race. No offense to some of the other candidates, but we've not seen them show the, the, the financial wherewithal to get on the air, and this race is gonna become a three or four week sprint about yep. paid media. Yep. TV and radio, digital ads. Evers is up in the polls, largely because he has name ID. He's run four times statewide, he's won three times. That number of 30%, give or take a few points, may be a byproduct of that name ID. Nobody has prodded that 30 points to see if they might be able to bring him down by raising themselves up. So Kelda Roy's is Emily's list, if they may do TV for her. Miller Mitchell has union backing, they may help him financially, they could get up there. Matt Flynn of the others, is the only person I know who had a decent fundraising period at the end of last year and has personal money. He could get up and he said this week, he's going up in the air in July. What's he going to say? It is kind of like the, the big question people have. He's already thrown elbows at Tony Evers. Might he try and throw some digs at Evers in TV? Because probably the calculation for Walks and Gronick, from what I can tell, is that they're self-funders. There was a, a, a path laid out of how you could maybe catch Evers in the polls, yeah. but it took a really big check it wasn't a very wide path. No, by the way, in the process, you gotta tear Tony down to get there. Yeah. That could produce a battered nominee. Right. Flynn may be the one we're watching. Will he be willing to do that kind of thing? Well, and uh, when you talk to Mr. Flynn in response to the demands from uh, Representatives Taylor and Sargent that he get out, I think he said, let me quote here, um, we, uh, this is an attempt to divide the party, which we don't need. 
when Mr. Flynn was on WIBA radio, I heard that. He said, quote, they're very naive, referring to Reps Taylor and, and Sargent. Somebody put them up to it. Chris Taylor is auditioning for a job in a Tony Evers cabinet, which she denies. So, by the way, calling two sitting female Democratic lawmakers naive after you told women's groups to go jump in a lake when they first called them to jump, drop others, because it's not going to help them either with certain demographics, Democratic primary. Good point. Okay. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. That's Rewind for June 2 9. Rewind, your week in review is sponsored by the Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. Sharing one goal, enhancing the quality of life in Wisconsin through the development and maintenance of a strong transportation network. The Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin, it's how we get there.